Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Mordian Glory video. In today's episode, we are going to be taking a look at the golden rules for playing Mech Guard. This video is designed to be a beginner's guide, pointing you in the right direction and helping you get to grips with playing a mechanized force on the tabletop. It's also not been built with a specific edition in mind. Rather, we are going to be talking about core principles, things that will always be relevant to this style of warfare. So regardless of if you're watching this in 9th edition, 10th edition or whatever edition, there should still be some pretty useful information in here for you. Of course, this being the Mordian Glory channel, we will be looking at this primarily from the perspective of the Emperor's true finest, the Astra Militarum. But many of the things I'm going to cover are easily applicable to many other factions as well. As long as you're taking lots of infantry inside lots of transports, this video will be useful to you. And so without further ado, let's mount up, roll out, and dive right into today's episode. Now, before we get into the golden rules and guidelines themselves, let's just briefly cover what we mean by mech guard. We're not talking about people running around in mech suits or doing their best tower impression. We're talking about mechanized warfare, having your infantry loaded up into your armored personnel carriers. This means that you are fundamentally going to be using a lot of vehicles in your list. In fact, traditionally, in a mechanized force, you'll have no foot elements. You're not going to have anyone wandering around on their own two legs at the start of the game. Every single infantry unit in your army, be they squads or characters, will be mounted up in a transport. Now, if you're a guard player who's interested in getting into this style of list, then the transport that you want to be using as your go-to vehicle for all of your infantry is going to be the iconic Chimera APC. This thing has been synonymous with mechanized warfare in Warhammer 40k for decades. That's not to say, of course, that you can't use other transports like Valkyries or Toroxes, but it's just to let you know, if you're the kind of person that really wants to get into a style of play, you really want to immerse yourself in it and do it as traditionally and quote unquote properly as you can, then the Chimera should be your bread and butter. Little side note here, but you'll find that pretty much every faction has that go-to transport for their own mechanized style of army. So for Space Marines, you typically look at things like Rhinos and Razorbacks, for Eldar, you've got your Wave Serpents and Orcs, you've got things like trucks and battle wagons. Now, some of you may be wondering, what is the point in going for a mechanized force? Surely going down a more balanced route is better. Well, like with any SKU list, a mech army has its advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages is that you tend to spam a lot of cheap armor, but unlike going down a pure armored company list where you're looking at just taking main battle tanks like Lehman Russes, you actually have some ground game. You actually have the ability to play objectives. So not only do you get to have the steel might of the Imperium, but you also get to actually win games and score points. However, the big disadvantage of mechanized warfare is you have to pay for a lot of transports. This means that you have less models on the board. And so what you tend to find is you have less firepower than an armored list, although you still have plenty of DACA, but you also have less ground game, less objective game than a hybrid or infantry force. Overall, mechanized warfare in 40K tends to be a little bit more precise than the blunt instrument that is a pure infantry or pure tank army. This can make it really enjoyable because it feels like you're actually having to use some skill and brain power to get those victories. But now that we've covered the general principles and ideas of mech warfare, let's take a look at the specific golden rules, the fundamental things you need to be keeping in the back of your mind when you're building mech lists and playing them on the tabletop. The first golden rule, and the one that is probably the most important and is completely different to pretty much any other kind of guard army, especially infantry and hybrid ones, is you wanna be focusing on toys over boys. 
Your inventory is actually incredibly valuable. You don't have a huge amount of it. Most mechanized armies will be running 50 or 60 bodies and the rest of it is going to be made up of vehicles. This relative lack of infantry means that you have to husband it very carefully because your infantry are still going to be the ones that are doing your secondaries, claiming those primary objectives and allowing you to score a lot of victory points. It might sound crazy, especially to veteran guard players, but it's actually more important. It's actually a better outcome for you if you lose a Chimera or another vehicle than to lose one of your limited infantry squads in a mech list. I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to have an abundance of armor. There's always going to be another fighting vehicle that you can throw into the mix. But once you lose your objective secured, once you lose your objective control, you're going to find it very hard to stay in the game without your opponent just massively outscoring you. So when it comes to committing your infantry forces, it's better to do it a bit at a time. It's better to disembark one squad, take an objective, score those points, get them in the bag. And then if that infantry then dies, it's fine because you've still got four or five more squads in the bank for the remaining turns. Let me really hammer this point home and give you some examples from my own extensive experience with playing mechanized infantry guard. This is not me just wanking myself off, by the way. I have a pure Armageddon Steel Legion force. I regularly run half a dozen Chimeras plus all the support vehicles. And every single game, without fail, it's a 100% correlation, every single game that I have lost with my Armageddon Steel Legion, I lost because I got my infantry out far too early. If all of your infantry have been disembarked from their Chimeras within the first couple of turns, you're almost guaranteed to lose because your opponent will instantly target that. They'll instantly see that you have exposed your ability to actually score points and hold objectives and they will pick all your infantry up and suddenly you've still got firepower but now you're essentially running a weaker version of an armored company list and you've lost that advantage however i also don't want you being overly cautious overly protected if getting an infantry squad out will allow you to score points and get ahead of the game, that's great, even if it means they then die. It's all about knowing when to commit those forces, when to hold back and keep your guys inside the transports, and when to get them out and commit them to the fight. This is what I was talking about before with mechanized warfare requiring a bit more thought and precision. When it comes to having pure infantry guard, you could just march wave after wave after wave onto objectives and not worry if you make a mistake or two here and there. You've got the bodies to absorb those mistakes. Likewise, with your armored company, you could just blast everyone off the table and just not worry about points because if everyone's dead, then you get to score everything you want, right? But mech guard does require that thought. It requires patience. And most importantly, it requires practice. But this idea of tanks being sacrificial actually is very much part of the second golden rule we're going to look at as well which is the iron price this is all about the concept of sacrificing some tanks to protect others essentially you're still playing 40k you still need to be able to screen effectively now if you're very new to 40k and you're not certain what i mean by screening what it basically means is you need to have those units that are up front, very much on the edge of your front line, that are going to die. And by dying, they're going to do a very important job because they're going to absorb those first casualties. And also at the same time, they're going to help push back enemy reserves because generally enemy units can't deep strike in right next to you they've got to stay about nine inches away so if you've got a cheap screening unit let's say a sentinel or an infantry squad in a normal guard army what happens is you have that unit at the very front really pushing the boundaries and when your opponent tries to commit some reserves he has to stay nine inches away from that unit and because this unit is so far ahead of your army it means that the actually important stuff behind like your Lehman Russes protected from things dropping in and trying to charge them and blow them up right 
It also means that if you're facing like an assault army like World Eater, they come charging in rather than those berserkers just chopping your tanks or your valuable infantry like Kazakh into pieces. Instead, they end up just cutting apart a sacrificial squad and then they're stuck out in the open, at which point you're able to blast them away at your own leisure. And in a normal hybrid guard army where you're taking infantry and tanks, you use your infantry, your Cadians, your infantry squads, your Kriegers, your Katachans, you use them as the screening unit because they're cheap and they're plentiful and if they die there's always more of them and as long as the infantry is dying the tanks are doing the damage but in a mech army you've got to think completely differently because your infantry are really valuable so if you have your infantry up front screening everything you're going to lose on points as we said before so you still need to screen you just need to do it in a different way and in my opinion, there's essentially two ways of screening effectively with mech or any kind of vehicle heavy guard force. Number one, you need to have cheap vehicles that you don't mind if they die. You might have an empty Chimera, perhaps it's already unloaded its infantry into a nice safe firing position or on an objective. And it's kind of just running around as a bit of a metal box. Well, chuck that one forward, use it to push back the enemy, maybe absorb a charge, something like that. Or, you might want to have something like a Sentinel or a Hellhound. Things which, again, are relatively cheap. They're not quite as expensive as a main battle tank. And if they die, it's fine. But they've still got enough firepower that if screening isn't an overly active thing in your game, perhaps you're facing off against like Tau or Botan, those armies that don't really mind getting into a firefight with you, they've still got enough firepower to contribute to that engagement. So you've got the cheaper vehicles, the more sacrificial ones. Or, on the other hand, you completely turn the system upside down on its head and you actually create dedicated anti-charge and screening specialists. This is where you take a unit and you actually invest quite a few points into it to make it not only able to survive at the forefront, but actually also Thrive. They're not just expected to take a charge and die. They're actually expected to take a charge and start kicking ass. And in a mech army, these specialized tanks tend to take the form of Lehman Russ fireballs or Daka tanks. Starting off with that fireball, this is very much a traditional way of screening with a big tank. And it's where you take a Lehman Russ and you give it a Demolisher Cannon. So it's really got some hefty punch behind it. And then you strap three Heavy Flamers to this thing. The reason why so many Guard Commanders love the Lehman Russ Fireball is because not only is it able to just act as a brilliant offensive unit because it's got a Demolisher Cannon. So even if the enemy doesn't end up charging it, it's still able to sling down big old bunker busting shots and snap necks and cash checks. But if the opponent does decide to charge it, you let rip with 3D6 Heavy Flamers, which are all going to auto hit on Overwatch. But even if your opponent somehow does make it through the broiling waves of Prometheum, on the other end is a Lehman Russ. It's really tough. It's really durable. It's got loads of toughness. It's got loads of wounds. And it doesn't mind sitting in the combat. Because every turn that it's stuck in combat with you, it's just hosing you down with those heavy flamers. Now, a DACA tank is very similar. It operates under the same principles. It's just got a totally different loadout. So rather than having a Demolisher Cannon and Heavy Flamers, you're going to go for something like a Punisher Cannon, uh, maybe an Exterminator Auto Cannon, but typically a Punisher Cannon, and three Heavy Bolters, and you'll probably even strap a Storm Bolt or a Heavy Stubber on there as well. You're just trying to put out as many shots as possible. Some guard players prefer the Daka tank because A, it just feels cool rolling that many dice, but B, they do have a slight advantage in range. You might get into a fight where that Demarsha cannon and those heavy flamers really just never get into range before that tank gets picked off by a lot of enemy anti-tank firepower. Whereas a Lehman Russ with an exterminator auto cannon and all those heavy bolters and heavy stubbers, it doesn't mind being on the front, dackering away, drowning the enemy in shots and overwatch. But if it needs to hang back a little bit and do some more long range fast, but you just you're just in a game where combat isn't a thing. Perhaps you're just getting into a long range firefight with some Tau or some Marines, at which point you're going to find that the Daka tank is a bit more suited 
and a bit more flexible in those different situations. But all of this talk of specialized units leads me on to my third golden rule, which is the balanced equation. For every armored fist squad, that is an infantry squad that you've put in a transport. It's just a cool traditional name for those kind of units. You also want to have a support unit. Whilst your mechanized infantry squads are going to form the core of your army, they're going to be able to bring a decent amount of firepower with that objective control ability. They can't do everything themselves and they will need support from their big brothers. And I tend to recommend that you go for a one to one ratio, an equal mix for every infantry squad that you've got in a Chimera. You're going to want a Lehman Russ or a Manticore or a Squadron of Sensors anything that can provide you with a bit of specialism, a bit of extra fast support. Maybe instead of having your Chimeras be the screen, you take an extra squadron of Sentinels. They can go up front and do it. Instead of having an infantry squad firing shots out the back of the Chimera or the Chimera itself being dedicated to firepower, you've got a Lehman Rust there backing it up, clearing the way for the Armored Fist to go in. I'll give you an example for my own mech army, the Armageddon 234th Dragoons. I take six squads of infantry in Chimeras, and I have a few officers in there to support them as well. And I consider that my half a dozen, my core of my army. I then take four Lehman Russes and a couple of Manticores. Now, in my whole collection, I do actually have a couple more Lehman Russes on top of that, and I've got a couple of squadrons of sentinels and i've even got a hellhound in there as well but the point is that for every no matter what the addition is no matter how the meta may change i have got those six image squads they never change in those kind of areas but for every single one of those i'm taking i've got a fire support unit i've got an artillery unit i've got a dedicated screening unit i've got something else that can add a bit of extra weight to my mechanized assault of course, there is some wiggle room in that. You don't have to be completely strict to it. I have on occasion found myself taking six squads of infantry in the Chimeras, and then I've ended up going with five Lehman Russes and a couple of Manticores. I just so happened to have a few more fire support units. On other occasions, I've ended up with taking seven squads of infantry in Chimeras, and then I've taken one less fire support unit. It doesn't need to be something you stick to like glue. It's just a bit of a principle you want to have in the back of your head when you're building your list. Right, I've got my core of infantry. How many support units have I got here? And if you end up going too far down one route or the other, your list is going to suffer. So if you end up going for, let's say, you've got 12 units in your list in total. If nine of those are mechanized infantry and chimeras and only three of them are fire support, you'll probably find that you're going to struggle with just doing damage to the enemy. Chimeras are okay, but they're not units that are going to sweep the, the board clear of enemy units, right? They just they add a little bit of extra DACA to your list. On the other hand, if you have only got three infantry squads and chimeras, three of those armored fist units, and you've got nine fire support squads, well, you've just not got enough objective control in your list. You've got not got enough ground game there. So if you go too far one way or the other, you're going to start struggling. So that's why I say try and keep it in the middle. Try and keep it one-to-one. -one. If it ends up being, you know, 60% fire support, 40% armored fist, or 6% armored fist and 40% fire support, that's fine. But try and keep it as close to equal as you can. But now we get to our final golden rule. And this is a particular mechanized tactic that I really enjoy using. It's one that I've talked about several times on this channel over the course of quite a few editions, which is the lone wolf tactic. This is where you take a single unit. Maybe it's a hellhound. Maybe it's a chimera with a single infantry squad in it. And you put it on a flank. And you kind of keep it low key. Try and keep it so it's not overly obvious what it's trying to do. And whilst the main brawl is happening in the center of the board with all your other armored fish units and your demon russes and everything else just having a big old demolition derby, maybe on your left flank, maybe on the right, I would probably say just do it on one flank or the other. You don't need to do it on both. You've got this little sneaky bee unit. Perhaps it's a Armored Fist Squad that just spends a couple of turns just moving and advancing down a flank. A relatively quiet one, unopposed. It's not drawing a lot of attention. It's not doing a huge amount. Your opponent kind of almost forgets it's there because it's just this 
one little metal box and in a sea of metal boxes that's just working its way down a flank and suddenly maybe turn three turn four something like that it jumps into the game and what you do with these lone wolves is you use them to harass your opponent you use them to disrupt their plans you use them to go after his own isolated units because let me tell you if you've got five space marines sat on a backfield objective or a little flank objective they are not going to be able to deal with you sending a hellhound after them with you sending a chimera with infantry after them you've you've got armored might going up what is essentially against a token scrappler enemy unit but that enemy unit could be doing something really important your opponent might have a secondary which is hold this objective if you can just take it off them that's brilliant your opponent might be relying upon you forgetting that units there i mean how many times have we seen this little five man ten man units just sitting back holding objective trying not to draw any attention to themselves whilst they score victory points turn after turn after turn right this is where the lone wolf comes in they do that little flank attack they go after that little isolated unit i've had a hellhound take five turns to get to where it needed to get to but on that fifth turn it managed to take out the enemy unit that was holding that backfield objective and that just denied my opponent that last few little points that he needed to close distance and maybe even win the game. The key to a good lone wolf tactic is to not overly invest in it. It's one of those where if it goes off, it's brilliant. If it doesn't quite manage it, it's fine. You haven't lost a huge amount. That's why I typically like doing them with hellhounds. Hellhounds are a bit faster and a bit cheaper than a Libermus, but they don't quite have that durability to get into a big slugging match and they don't quite have that firepower to really just sweep enemy units, you know, big ones off the board or just to completely blow up enemy tanks. But they do have just enough firepower to harass, just enough firepower to go after those little isolated enemy units. Essentially, you want to be like a shark circling the wounded seal. And the moment that you get a chance to just go in there and have a bite, that's when you send the lone wolf in. And that, my little conscript, covers the basic fundamentals, the golden rules you need to know in order to be an effective mech guard commander. Now, of course, we've not covered all of the fine intricacies for running this type of list. We've just gone over some of the basics, pointed you in the right direction. But if you are a veteran mech guard commander and you think that I've missed something out or there's some particularly important information or some recommended units that you want to suggest, get all of that down in the comment section below. And if you are a new player watching this, make sure you check out those comments. There is a huge wealth of information down there and we've got a fantastic community here on the MG channel and you'll always find there's loads of great people putting great stuff down in that comment section. Of course, all of this is just like my opinion, man, as well. You very well may disagree with me. Let me know down in that comment section too. And also, if you've enjoyed today's video, don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe to never miss an episode. And if you want to go the extra mile and support the channel and see more content like this, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. One of the big perks you get for being a supporter is you gain access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost 1,500 active members. It's always popping off with the MG Discord, and we've got channels for painting, hobbying, army list, tactics, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. And I'd just like to take a moment to say a big thank you to all of the latest channel members. So a huge thank you to Major Problems, Red Bear 27, Axion, Kevin Goodrich, Templar, Carl Brand, Andrew Johnson, Cop 180, and Branagh Lair. Thank you guys for doing your part. I also want to give a shout out to the latest Patreons as well. So a big thank you to Bad Bet, Percy McDonald, Kevin Goodrich, Proxy Nevada, Jonah Payne, Christian Bashoff, OCDM, and Zar. Thank you guys for being Patreon supporters. And last but certainly not least, I would like to say a personal, heartfelt, and a special thank you to all of my top tier Patreon supporters. These are the War Masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. So I want to say a huge thank you to Alan Blunt III, Bon Bon Vert, Mark Panconi, Ross Miller, Sawfish Trombone, John Stubbs, Diesel Fox, August Varney, and absolute rubbish. 
thank you guys. Your ongoing and incredibly generous support makes a huge difference. I hope you all enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.